down or yeah. start video? Okay. 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 Hey, hello. So uh, welcome to the multi-party uh, computation and garbage circuit uh, session. We have uh, six talks. The first talk is by Pierre Mayer. Uh, how is volume here? Okay, perfect. So, I'm going to show the screen. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Good. Uh, hello everyone, thank you for uh, joining this talk about breaking the circuit size barrier on the quasi-polynomial LPN, which is joint work of Fakuto. So despite the length of the title, the problem is actually very simple to state. Alice and Bob wish to, put, to, to perform some secure computation. So the secure computation of a circuit where they share the inputs. Now, in order to guarantee uh, some security properties, you have to expend a certain amount of resources communication and computation. The question is, can you uh, only use an amount of communication which is sublinear in the size of the circuit, which is the number of gates? In this setting, you don't really care about computation so long as it remains polynomial. So before this work, uh, there were uh, many solutions. I'm not going to talk really about the correlated randomness model or the FHE-based solutions because our work is more about uh, HSS, homomorphic secret sharing. So you have a secret sharing team equipped with some homomorphic properties. You take your additive, you take some shares of the input, which you can convert into additive shares of some function of the input. So there are a couple of assumptions under this, under which this tool is known. And our contribution is simply to add LPN to this list of assumptions under which you can do sublinear computation. So let's talk uh, very, very briefly about how the protocol can work using this homomorphic secret sharing. The first thing to note is that it doesn't capture the, we can't do a sublinear computation for all circuits. We have to choose some, and we do it for the class of layered circuits. That simply means that you can partition the gates into layers such that wires only go from one layer to the next. But it is a very general class of circuits. So the reason why we uh, use uh, this layered assumption is that if you take a circuit which is layered, you can partition it into chunks of very shallow depth circuits. And shallow circuits are perfectly, uh, are perfectly adequate for homomorphic secret sharing. Because what you do, the parties first, they convert the, uh, the, the inputs into shares of inputs, and then you, you apply homomorphic secret sharing to do the homomorphic operation on the shares in order to get shares of the first chunk, and then you continue and you continue and you continue. So this at a high level is how you achieve computation, oh, sorry, communication, where you save a factor K, which hopefully is super, is super constant. So that's all I'm going to say about how the protocol works. Our contribution is essentially then to uh, instantiate homomorphic secret sharing for super constant depth circuits under LPN. And LPN is exactly what I'm going to talk to you now about. So what kind, there's a, there's a huge family of LPN assumptions, which is the one we're going to use. So learning parity with noise essentially just says that if you take a linear system of equations and you add some sparse noise, it becomes hard to invert. So this problem is parameterized by three quantities, the dimension, uh, the dimension of the problem, the number of samples you give the adversary, and the sparsity of the error. So the number, of the, instead of considering the sparsity directly, we usually consider the rate, which is the uh, number of noisy coordinates divided by the number of samples. So the specific flavor of LPN we're using is instantiated with these parameters, uh, but it's uh, ugly to present this way. So let's just have a look at the graphic of how this compares with other LPN assumptions. So the strength, uh, the, LPN problem becomes harder for the adversary as the noise rate grows and as the number of samples decreases. So the most standard versions you probably know are constant LPN and polynomial LPN. 
constant being the most secure uh, assumption there is uh, in this category. So uh, the best known attacks uh, here, so uh, what, I what you see here are the best known attacks in each of these regimes. And the specific assumption we're making is lies here. So we have a very small noise rate, which would be a problem most often, but uh, what's good for us is that we only give the adversary a very limited number of samples. So this, the novelty about this assumption is that the uh, best known attack is exponential in the security parameter and doesn't, is not, it's not expressed as a function of the dimension as is usually the case. And for our protocol to be secure, we only need security about, uh, against quasi-polynomial sized adversaries. So there's a big gap between the best known attack and what we require. Now, uh, just before uh, we can move on to questions, I'd just like to share uh, uh, just a thought on how best to choose uh, the title of a paper. Because, uh, so this, as you may recall, is the title of our paper. So uh, it's vaguely reminiscent of another paper from a few years ago. And it would be a shame if someone were to introduce a new metric for how impactful a paper is, where the matrix is essentially to normalize the citation count in order to uh, give a chance to newer papers. It would especially be a, a shame if someone were to confuse the two papers and take the citation count of the older paper, but the age of this paper, which is being presented here for the very first time. Because in that case, you'd actually make it the number one spot of the most influential crypto papers of all time, according to this metric, which I discovered uh, the same as you. So even though this is perhaps hoping a bit much, uh, I, I hope you still enjoy uh, reading our paper in, on the eprints. Thank you very much. So uh, are there any questions? Any questions? Yeah. I have to say, I also tried this trick once. There was two papers, private circuits one, private circuits two, not by myself. And then I, we wrote with FX a paper, uh, private circuits three. Uh, and so also a lot of well, the same prefixes as the previous papers, but somehow I think we didn't get this effect. So, ah, right. There's a certain amount of luck involved. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. Um, so the next uh, speaker is uh, Mayank Rati, and this will be an online talk. I hope I can set it up. Uh, can you can you see my screen? Yes. Yes, we can see your screen. Uh, okay, I'll I'll start then. So um, today I'll be talking about our work on function secret sharing for a mixed mode and fixed point secure computation, which is joint work with Alet Nishant, Neep, Divya, Yuval, and Nishant. In this talk, we'll be working in the two PCB pre-processing model, where uh, computation proceeds in two phases. Uh, in the in the pre-processing phase, a dealer distributes correlated randomness to the two main parties. And then the parties in the online phase use this correlated randomness along with uh, their secret inputs to compute some joint function. And for this talk, we will assume that we have access to a trusted dealer and of the other two parties, at most one party is semi-honest corrupted. But I should mention here that the ideas discussed in this talk are also applicable to other settings like 2PC, 3PC, malicious parties, et cetera. And if you want to uh, know more about that, I encourage you to take a look at uh, the longer video or our paper. So uh, what is function secret sharing? Uh, FSS allows you to take a function F with outputs in a finite abelian group and split it into two shares, F0 and F1, give one share to each of the parties, and the parties can now locally evaluate uh, their own share such that uh, when we add them back together, you, we get back the output of the original function F. And these FSS shares are called FSS keys. Uh, and of, of a few properties that one needs from a function secret sharing scheme, uh, the property of a key importance for this talk will be of security where we want that uh, the key uh, 
the, a single key itself hides the parent function actually. Uh, also for this talk, we will uh, just be focusing on these special type of functions called comparison functions, which are parameterized by alpha and beta. So when you input a value which is less than alpha, the function outputs beta, otherwise it outputs a zero. And an FSS scheme for this class of uh, comparison functions is uh, called a distributed comparison function or a DCF. So uh, in 2019, uh, Boyle et al. showed uh, how to use function secret sharing to do two PC with preprocessing. Their idea starts by representing your entire computation as, a, as an arithmetic circuit. And then for each gate in this circuit uh, with input wire X and output wire Y, we're going to do the following. We're going to uh, change uh, those wire uh, to now uh, those wires to now carry masked values. So x now uh, x becomes now x plus r and y uh, becomes y plus s, where r and s, s are these uh, secret masks that that need to be hidden. And uh, to ensure correctness, we also need to change the gate's original functionality functionality from f to f hat r s, which now takes as input x plus r and outputs on y plus s. And uh, the dealer is now uh, in the pre-processing phase, dealer is now going to give out uh, FSS keys for all of these, these hat gates uh, to both the parties. And the key idea here is that uh, since R and S need to be hidden from the two parties because they are the, they are the secret masks, FSS or FSS's uh, security property already provides you that. Uh, uh, so yeah, so that's, that's their, uh, their idea. And uh, uh, with this approach, uh, the online communication per party is just one group element per gate. Uh, and this happens over just a single round of communication. So how well does this compare to other approaches for two PC with pre-processing? Um, so for this table, I'd like you to, to think of uh, some commonly found non-arithmetic gates. So something which is more complex than a typical addition or multiplication. And in the first row, we have garbage circuits adap adapted to the trusted dealer model. Uh, with this approach, uh, you have high online communication and a high correlated randomness size. But the good thing is that the online rounds is just two. Uh, with GMW, you have low to moderate online communication, which uh, sort of like depends on which non-arithmetic gate we're talking about. Uh, it has a uh, high online rounds, but the good thing is that your correlation size uh, will be quite low. And uh, with prior FSS, uh, we have uh, low online communication just a single online round, like I mentioned in the previous slide, but uh, the correlation size is quite high. Uh, and that is precisely what we improve in this work. So we reduce that to now be sort of like an order of magnitude better in some cases. Uh, to give you a concrete idea of our improvements, uh, think of a, a gate, a gate, gate wires, carry, uh, think of circuit wires carrying 16 bit values. So for the ReLU gate, uh, we achieve a Two, two times better key size than garbled circuits uh, and six times better than prior FSS. Uh, for, for the sigmoid gate, which is approximated with a 12 piece spline, the improvements are uh, way more substantial at 15 and 22 X. Uh, for a bit decomposition, we are 11 X better than prior FSS, but a slightly worse than garbled circuits. And we do implement a few more gates as well, um, which I won't have time to go over in this talk. But uh, the main point here is that uh, uh, all the uh, that in the in the prior in the prior constructions, all these gates required multiple DCF keys, and in this work, we now require just a single DCF key for most of these gates, except for uh, bit decomposition and write shift. So all the other gates now just require a single DCF key, no matter how many comparisons are actually there inside those gates. To list down our contributions, uh, our first contribution in this work is to improve the key size for the DCF itself by 4x. So this benefits all of these non-arithmetic gates directly. And then for some commonly found gates, uh, we do uh, we, we take things even further by uh, relaxing an assumption that was uh, made in the prior work. So uh, in the prior work, uh, it was assumed that the intervals uh, inside these gates uh, should have uh, secret boundaries. Like that was the assumption, but it turns out that that's an overkill for most applications. To convince you about that, uh, let me give you an example of the ReLU gate. So in the ReLU gate, uh, if there's a ReLU gate, then everyone knows that the intervals inside the gate are just checking for non-negative values. So this is already public information, so it doesn't need to be kept secret. And by relaxing this assumption, we are able to uh, get much better uh, key, key, re key size reductions. Then we provide, uh, uh, we show how to uh, evaluate new kinds of gates with FSS, like right shift. Uh, we show how to do two, two, two round fixed point multiplication and prove a barrier for uh, doing that in a single round with symmetric cryptography only. Uh, and then we provide uh, protocols for uh, distributed key generation for DCFs, which is quite similar to the 
uh, distributed key generation for distributed point functions if uh, by Dorn and Shalad. And uh, we also show how to handle malicious evaluators. And if you're interested in any of those things, please take a look at our paper or the full talk. That would be it. Thank you. Thank you very much. We have one question. Hi. Uh, yeah, so um, in the round complexity, you mentioned that uh, garbled circuit based approach required two rounds and uh, FSS required one round, but one round is just per level of the FSS circuit, right? The in actual circuit might have many FSS gates. So the round complexity would be the number of FSS gates that you have in your overall circuit, whereas in garbled circuits, it would be just one round independent of the depth of the circuit, right? Yes, yes, yeah, you're, you're right. So the 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 point here is that uh, we are considering this mixed mode computation where you have these uh, non arithmetic gates uh, leave interlude with uh, these arithmetic gates. For example, uh, you want to evaluate a sort of like a, a non arithmetic computation, like a comparison followed by multiplications, for example, or additions. And these things, uh, doing them inside garbled circuits is completely infeasible. So in this mixed mode setting, what people do is that uh, they break down this computation as these gates. And these gates are now, and now you just talk about how uh, efficiently can you evaluate a single gate rather than uh, doing the entire computation inside garbled circuits because that would be completely infeasible just because so, of. Uh, yeah. so, 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 is that correct that uh, the round complexity of FSS should not be mentioned as one, rather circuit depth? So, uh, for mixed mode circuits, the FSS uh, round complexity one is actually one per circuit level. So uh, it's not like one for the entire computation, it's one per circuit level. And for garbled circuits, it's two per circuit level. So if you do this mixed mode style computation, but if you want to do, uh, if you want to just uh, do, uh, if you don't care about communication and just care about uh, rounds, then uh, you can put everything inside a garbled circuit, but that would be uh, way inefficient. Okay, so uh, second question, uh, for splines and uh, sigma evaluation, did you evaluate those on fixed point uh, numbers? Yes, yes, yeah, we did that on fixed point. Okay, okay, thanks. Uh, are there any more questions? Uh, if not, then we'll have the next talk. I also have one announcement. So there will be another talk, so the seventh talk in the session by Elaine Shi, who was confused about the time zones. So she missed the, her slots in the previous session and she will be joining us as the last speaker of this session. Uh, so the next uh, speaker is uh, Philip Shopman, who is here. Okay, does it work? Yes, it does. Um, yeah, hi. So I'm going to talk about uh, Vol PSI, Fast OPRF, and Circuit PSI from Vector Oli. So this is work that I did during my PhD at Humboldt University of Berlin, and it's joint work with Peter Rindel from Visa Research. So quick introduction, what is PSI? Private set in the section. Maybe you have to click somewhere. If you click. Let me just hide that. Well, I yeah. I I know it's sorry. The, the right place. Okay, hide hide video panel maybe. I hide, hide video panel. Hide hide. Okay. All right. Okay. Sorry for that. Um, we want to have a two-party protocol between Alice and Bob, and they both both have inputs uh, different items. So here, shapes and different colors. And what they want to learn at the end of the protocol is which items they have in common. So that's the standard PSI setting. And they want to learn nothing uh, beyond that. So in particular, nothing about the elements that are not in the intersection. So there are many variants. For example, we could have both parties have the input or only one of them. And we could have associated values. We could have the output being secret shared. So uh, different variants of that. But I'm going to uh, start with the very simplest approach. So the most common approach to build PSI protocols in the recent years was based on oblivious pseudorandom functions or OPRFs. What is an OPRF? It's a functionality that generates a, a random key K and gives that to Alice. 
And on the other hand, it allows Bob to basically apply a PRF that is keyed with K, uh, K uh, apply a pseudorandom function to any number of inputs he chooses to. So now that Alice has the private key, she can locally apply the PRF to her inputs and just send those evaluations over. And now Bob can locally uh, compare these uh, PRF evaluations of all the elements, and actually he knows which elements are in the intersection. So that's a very simple PSI protocol built from an OPRF. So now we reduce the problem to uh, finding efficient uh, implementations of OPRFs. And in our paper, what we did was build an OPRF from a vector OLE generator. So I'm quickly going to uh, present what is this. A vector OLE generator is basically a functionality that uh, creates uh, pseudorandom vectors, A, B, and C, as well as a pseudorandom scalar delta. And we have the correlation between all of the pseudorandom values that C equals A delta plus B. You can think of this as a secret sharing of a scalar vector multiplication. So if we have such a generator and it returns the values delta and B to, to Alice and A and C to Bob, then no party knows anything about uh, uh, the, the other party's inputs. So what can we do with such a corre correlation? Well, Bob can use it to hide his input set. More precisely, what Bob can do is interpolate or uh, solve a linear system that represents his input set. Here, this is uh, this vector P that Bob is going to hide using the vector he gets out of the vector only correlation. So Bob has to solve this linear system, M P equals the hashes of his input elements. And here MX is a public matrix. So given any, uh, any set of element X, you, everybody can publicly compute this matrix MX. So assuming we have that, and assuming Bob can solve this linear system efficiently, he can just hide his solution with the output of the vector only correlation, send that over to Alice. Alice can multiply that with her delta and apply her B, whatever, and then plug that into a random oracle and get her PRF output. So if you do the math and uh, input, well, the fact that if two elements are equal, so if on the left side, Alice had an element Y that is equal to X on Bob's side, then if you do the math, you will get that the output of this OPRF will in fact be equal. At the same time, there's a very low probability that Bob can encode more than his input set into this vector P. So he cannot force his uh, OPRF correlation to be correct for any other values that he didn't input into the OPRF protocol. So, okay, now the big question is, of course, what's this matrix M, right? We need it in the evaluation, we need it in Bob's uh, solving of the linear system. So if this matrix M is not of a nice structure, then solving the linear system takes cubic time. So what can we do? One way to uh, represent this matrix M is using the Vandermont matrix. And that means that uh, the matrix M at an index X consists of just the powers of X. Now, if you have such a matrix, then actually uh, the product of a row with any vector corresponds to evaluating a polynomial uh, that has the, in, uh, has the coefficients of this vector at the point X. So now uh, solving a linear system corresponds to polynomial interpolation and there are efficient algorithms to do that. So th they run in uh, O of n log squared n. What we would like to do is get rid of this log squared factor. And there's a paper from uh, last year by Pinkas, Rosulek, Chiu, and uh, Yanai. And that actually is a solution that allows you to uh, solve a linear system in only linear time. So only linear time, only linear space, that's the optimum we can hope for. And roughly the idea is inspired by cuckoo hashing. So any row of this matrix M will have a constant number of uh, non-zero values on the left side. And then on the right side, the right side is quite small, we have a uniform random uh, structure. And now that can be solved very efficiently. So, okay, what does it give us? Here are some timings in the semi honest model for a quite small input set size. And you can see that uh, our protocol already has the lowest communication of all the ones that we compared against. But uh, in particular, if we include a one-time setup that comes from the vector only generator, then it's also the fastest in all settings that, is, uh, that are communication constrained. And if we increase the size of the input set, uh, it becomes even faster for, uh, if, even if we include this one-time setup phase. Similar things you can see in the malicious setting. So in fact, our protocol is also maliciously secure. And yeah, finally, also a quick look ahead. So there are several things you can improve in our protocol. One thing is you can, of course, use a more efficient vector only generator. And there has been one proposed actually this year at crypto. So that's called silver. 
And another one is you could replace this Paxos data structure that we use by different kinds of uh, oblivious key value stores. And again, there have been some proposed in this paper also uh, that appeared to crypto. So there's room for improvement. And with that, I'd like to conclude and thank you. Are there any questions to Philippe? If not, then let's send the speaker again. The next speaker is David Heath. Uh, David, uh, do you hear us? Okay, uh, just quickly check you can hear and see my slides. Yes. Okay, great. Uh, so I'm going to be uh, briefly introducing uh, Logstack. So Logstack is an improvement to the classic uh, YAL uh, garbled circuit technique. And in particular, Logstack is an improvement on our recent stacked garbling technique. So stacked garbling is an improvement to garbled circuits that decreases the communication consumption of garbled circuits for circuits that include exclusive conditional behavior. So for instance, if the source program that you'd like to evaluate has if statements or switch statements, then stacked gar garbling greatly reduces communication consumption of that program. However, it also turns out that stacked garbling greatly increases the computation consumed by the two parties. So in this follow-up work, we show that you can greatly decrease the com computation overhead incurred by stack garbling. Uh, so let's get started. So recall that garbled circuits is a foundational MPC technique that allows two parties, a GC uh, garbled circuit generator and a garbled circuit evaluator to securely evaluate some function F over their private inputs, so long as F is expressed as a Boolean circuit. At a high level, the idea is that the two parties start by considering the circuit C, and the generator then uh, constructs a sort of encryption of the circuit and then sends this encryption across the wire to the evaluator. And this encryption allows the evaluator to step through the gate, uh, step through the circuit gate by gate, uh, propagating encryptions of input wires to encryptions of output wires. And then at the end, the party, parties can jointly decrypt the output wires. Now in this setting, I'd like to consider a circuit that has some sort of conditional branching in it. So you can consider there's some part of the circuit C that has conditional behavior. Here I have four circuits drawn. And in particular, imagine that it only matters that one of these circuits is actually evaluated for the overall computation. So the outputs of all except for one of these circuits is going to be ultimately discarded because of conditional branching. And moreover, the parties don't know which of these uh, branches is actually going to be evaluated. Now, the standard way that you would handle this conditional branching is that the generator would construct encryptions of each of the four branches and then send each of these encryptions across the wire to the evaluator. Unfortunately, this is very expensive. In garbled circuit, the encryptions of circuits are very large, and so encrypting and sending separately is expensive. In stacked garbling, we showed that this is actually unnecessary. It turns out to be possible to, instead of sending four different encryptions, you can take the bitwise XOR and do what we call stack together the encryptions and send only this stack to the evaluator. So uh, I can't go into the details of how this works, but this greatly decreases the communication cost of garbled circuits for conditional branching. However, it turns out that this procedure also uh, increases the computation cost. I don't have enough time to show you exactly why, but I wanna give you some sort of flavor. Uh, the idea is that Stacked garbling causes the evaluator to sort of make mistakes on the inactive conditional branches. That is, she's not going to properly uh, propagate encryptions of input wires to output wires, but rather she's going to uh, compute sort of garbage encryptions. That is, the output of the inactive branches will be random labels as opposed to well-formed labels, uh, garbled circuit labels. Now, it turns out that 
this is fine from a semantics point of view, but to proceed past the end of the conditional, we need to eliminate these garbage output labels. And it turns out to do so, the generator needs to know what these garbage output values are. Now, the bottom line is that in stacked garbling, there are a quadratic number of mistakes that the evaluator can make. And so to account for all possible mistakes, the generator has to do a quadratic amount of work. Okay, so if we look at a, a chart of, of the costs of evaluating conditionals inside of gar garbled circuits, using standard techniques, we use linear communication and computation. And using stack garbling, we improve the communication to independent of the number of branches, but the computation is quadratic in number of branches. And this is obviously undesirable. So in this work, log stack, we directly improve on this. So first of all, we, we retain this important uh, communication advantage where our communication is independent of the number of branches, but we improve computation such that there is only logarithmic overhead over what you would expect. I don't have time to explain how this works in any detail, but at a very high level, the idea is that Logstack organizes your branches into a binary tree, and then it carefully arranges that the number of mistakes that the evaluator can, can uh, arrive at is decreased. Since the number of mistakes is decreased, the amount of pre-computation that the generator has to do is also decreased, and this is how we get our logarithmic overhead. So, in addition to asymptotic improvement, we implemented Logstack and we show that uh, Logstack dramatically improves over both standard garbled circuits where you don't use any uh, fancy techniques for conditional branching and also over our stacked garbling technique. And so the bottom line is that what this means is that now garbled circuits are very efficient for circuits that have complex conditional control flow. So with that, I will conclude and I'll be happy to take any questions. Any questions? I think Pierre has a question. Um, yes. Um, your your uh, stacking is compatible with the free Excel uh, optimization, yes? Uh, are you aware of any techniques which uh, are incompatible with, uh, garbling, with stacked garbling? Yes, so we have a requirement that at, at a very high level, we parameterize over an underlying garbling scheme. However, uh, if your garbling scheme produces circuit garblings, which are not indistinguishable from uniform randomness, then there's an incompatibility. So for example, uh, there are techniques in uh, arithmetic garbled circuits, which if you take it off the shelf, it will not be compatible with stacked garbling because those encryptions are not necessarily going to look like uniform random strings. They might look like an arrangement of, of uh, field elements in some, in some arithmetic field. And because of that, you can't a priori plug it in. Um, yes, so any, anytime you have a garbling scheme which produces things which are non-uniform strings, it doesn't work with stack garbling. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Any more questions? If not, then let's thank the speaker again. And the next speaker is Eduardo, Eduardo Soria Vasquez. Is that working online? Do you see the presentation? Yes, we do. So thanks for the introduction. Uh, this paper is also about carbon circuits, but it's about multi-party carbon circuits. And actually like multi-party with a lot of parties. So that's the large scale bit. And it is joint work with Aner Benafrim, Kelon Kong, Eran Omri, Emmanuel Orsini, and Nigel Smart. So, yeah. So um, our goal is large scale MPC. So we want to have many, many parties 
And uh, we also want to have a constant round uh, protocol in this case, because network will be a problem. Um, so uh, we, we go for garbled circuits in this case, but there's problems with that, so in, with scalability. And uh, concretely, uh, we are going to deal with active adversaries, and we are going to be in the dishonest majority setting. There have been other talks about uh, large scale MPC in this conference, and they were in the honest majority setting. So this is like a different scenario. And since we are doing garbled circuits, we will go for like Boolean circuits. Okay, so one could think like this problem of uh, scaling garbled circuits, it, it could, it's like solving theory, right? You could just say, okay, take just Jao's classic protocol, and I'm going to emulate this two party protocol as a multi party protocol. And the size of the gates of the garbled circuit is going to be independent of the number of parties, which is what happens in, in reality, right? Uh, sorry, in, in, in that protocol. But, you know, like that's in theory, that's solved. So these are made up reviews, by the way. <laughs> uh, but in practice, that's going to be horribly inefficient, right? If you're going to do this double encryption with an MPC, like uh, evaluating a PRF, uh, it's going to be horrible. Um, so this theoretical approach, uh, yeah, it would be a constant round protocol. The size of the gates is independent of the number of parties, could be actively secure if you use an actively secure protocol to emulate that, but will be horribly inefficient. Uh, on the other hand, if you take like the state of the art protocols uh, for multi party garbled circuits, they are constant round, but they have this issue that the size of the gates is linear in the number of parties. And moreover, evaluating these gates takes quadratic time in the number of parties. So that's not good for scalability. And uh, there's some previous work that uh, deals with these issues, but it is only passively secure. So it produces um, constant size uh, garbled gates. Uh, but yeah, it's only for passive adversaries. And moreover, it doesn't support the free XOR optimization. So what we do, we tick all the boxes. Okay. Um, so I don't have time to say much uh, about our techniques, but we use LPN to do the garbling. Uh, so the truth table will now be encrypted under one using like a DLPN based kind of encryption. It's going, you're going to encrypt under your left wire key plus a permutation of the bits of your right wire key. Uh, this is permutation is something we need to do because we have free XOR and otherwise the correlation could cancel out when you add these keys together. And uh, since we are dealing with the free XOR case one more time, uh, this implies that there's some kind of circularity. You're encrypting this correlation delta and there are keys that have this correlation delta. Uh, but we prove that our scheme is secure under the standard DLPN assumption and we only lose as much security as the number of cycles in this permutation of the bits of the right wire key. So I invite you to check the paper or the recording for that. Um, once we have this garbling, we propose two kinds of protocols. In the first one, we sample of obliviously the keys and the noise for LPN. Uh, the good thing about this is that this is very simple to understand. Uh, once you have sampled all these values, uh, you are just doing linear operations because matrix vector multiplication is going to be linear over F2. And we can even have like a single honest party. Uh, the bad thing is that this sampling is really expensive. Uh, so this is kind of conceptual, let's say. Uh, and we have a second variant where the parties locally sample the keys of LPN and the shares of this noise. Uh, so this is much more better in terms of the pre-processing um it's also in order to to do this we assume some fraction of honest parties so say 10 percent 20 percent whatever you're comfortable with and uh, it makes it a bit more difficult to prove security and uh, again details are in the paper uh the bad thing though is that this approach require it's a bit makes it a bit harder to find like good error correction codes that you need in this encryption based on on lpn so I want to finish just by talking about experimental evaluation. Uh, our, pro our implementation is very much a proof of concept. We only implement like the evaluation phase of this garbled circuit. Uh, what we find out is that our protocol is actually like not much lower than this passively secure protocol that was there before. If you take a circuit like this is for AS, for example, so you have a lot of extra gates there for free for us. So that's why we're only a bit, a bit slower. And um, 
we start being faster than the state-of-the-art protocols that have uh, gates of size linear in the number of parties as soon as we have like 100 parties or so. And this could be moved like to a quite smaller number because this could improve a lot if you use better codes and better decoding algorithms. So we use some concatenated codes and uh, we decode either using syndrome decoding, uh, if we can fit it in memory, uh, or um, we do better camp otherwise. So yeah, if you use like general minimum distance decoding or you use like quasi-cyclic uh, low density parity check codes, uh, this could be improved a lot. But anyway, the idea is that we have this point at 100 parties, maybe you can reduce it to 60 or I don't know. So with that, I would like to conclude my talk and take any questions, thank you. Are there any questions to Eduardo? Is there anything online? Okay, if not, then let's thank the speaker again. And now our next speaker will be Michele Ciampi. Hello. Can you see my slide? Yeah, uh, well, uh, no, wait, I have to. Uh, have to share another screen. Wait. Uh, yeah, this is kill, kill this one. Okay. Yeah. Now we can see your screen. Okay. Shall I start? Yes. Please go ahead. Okay. So, hi everyone. I am uh, Michele Ciampi, and uh, I'm going to talk about uh, threshold garbage circuits and ad hoc secure computation. This is a joint work with uh, people Goyal and Rafael Ostrowski. So let's consider a function f that has, for simplicity, n inputs and n outputs. And let's say that this function can be uh, described as a Boolean circuit. Uh, then um, we can use garbage circuits and uh, to encode um, this function in the following way. So basically a garbage circuit has two algorithms. The first is the garbling algorithm that takes us input the description of the function and outputs uh, the garbling uh, scheme F and a set of labels. But precisely for, for each wire, which represent an input of the function, uh, we will have like two labels. So one label, in this case, the blue labels would represent an encoding of zero and the red labels will represent an encoding of one. So the idea here is that then uh, we can use a second algorithm, a devaluation algorithm, that on input, the garbling table, capital F, and a set of labels, more precisely, we need exactly one label per wire. We can compute the output of the function on the input uh, encoded in these labels. As in this example here, for example, the first label it represents an encoding of zero. So the first input of the function will be zero and, and so on. So in terms of security, what we want is that if we give uh, the garbling of this uh, function to an adversary, and we also give exactly one label per wire to this adversarial party, the adversary should learn nothing more than the output of the function that can be inferred by running the evaluation procedure using this set of, la of labels. So there are two uh, limitations of these um, uh, of garbage circuits. So the first one is that to run the evaluation procedure, we need exactly one label per wire. So if we have less than n labels, it's not clear uh, whether we can compute the output, or at least in general, it's not true that we can compute something meaningful. The second is that uh, if an adversary gets, for example, two labels per one wire, like in this example, he gets two labels for the second, for the last wire, then maybe the security of the garbage circuit is completely compromised in the sense that in this case, 
it might very well be that the adversary can understand that the, blue, the first blue label here is an encoding of zero and is not supposed to learn that. So the first contribution of this uh, work is a notion of garbage circuit that is secure in these uh, two uh, scenarios. So more precisely, what we do is that instead of considering um, um, an input function, now the function allows for uh, k inputs. So now the garbling needs also to take this parameter k and the output is the same as before. So we still have n pair of labels and the garbling of the circuit. But the idea, and I mean, here, the nice thing is that to run the evaluation procedure, we just need any subset of sites k of labels where all the label, each label is for, for, a, for a different wire, of course. And um, if we have these k labels, then we can run the evaluation procedure and get the output of this k input function. I want to stress that uh, during the garbling phase, we only need to know this k parameter, and we don't need to know what is the set or the indices of the labels that will be used during the evaluation. This is something that is needed only uh, for the evaluation. And the other property is that if, for example, the adversary, let's say, um, corrupts uh, an input position, when I say corrupt, he corrupts, I mean that he gets uh, a pair of labels for, for some wire, like in this example, he gets two labels for the last wire, then the only thing that the adversary learned is the function and the output of the function on this uh, set of labels. So in this example here, it will be only able to switch the last input of, of the function. Um, so the construction that we give is a compiler that combines a notion of garbage circuit that already allows for corruption with the new notion of secret sharing that we call positional secret sharing that we, um, what we provide and uh, uh, instantiate information theoretically. So giving any scheme that supports the corruption of L inputs, uh, then we have a scheme that not only allows the corruption of L input slots, but also has this threshold uh, characteristic. The second country, for the second contribution, we consider a notion that was introduced by uh, Baimel et al, where like not the number of labels that might be available uh, to the uh, evaluator or to the adversary is not just k, but this k plus some c, for example. So what we do is that we study the case where this c is a constant, and we show that, uh, first of all, our positional circuit sharing scheme uh, has a stronger notion of security. And then combined with the LW assumption, we show a scheme that is secure and that uh, remains secure even if uh, the evaluator gets not just K labels, but K plus C labels, where C is an arbitrary constant. If you look at our um, uh, extended talk and to our paper, uh, we have cast all our definitions and construction in the setting of uh, private simultaneous, uh, in the private simultaneous message uh, model. And unfortunately, I will not have time to go into the constructions, but uh, for that, I will be happy to talk uh, offline or take questions later. And for more detail, please look at the extended talk. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much. I think we have a question. Hi. So um, this notion of uh, being uh, able to evaluate on some subset uh, of the inputs, is it um, just like uh, secret sharing your in inputs using a K comma N scheme uh, so that you can reconstruct the input uh, just using K labels and then evaluate the garbled circuit? Or is there something different going on? So unfortunately, there is something different. So the idea, it's I mean, it's basically what you just said. But unfortunately, just secret sharing, it's not sufficient because the idea here is that depending on the subset of label, on the subset of indices that you have for the labels, then you need to disclose different secrets, and that's the challenging part, let's say. 
But more or less, the idea under the hood is what you just said. So, and the way we achieve it is exactly by combining just you know chaos of secret sharing in a in a nice and non-trivial way to achieve uh, to achieve this. And uh, yeah, that's more or less what we do. Okay, thanks. Thank you. Uh, any more questions to Michela? If not, then let's thank the speaker again. And thank you. Yes, and now we are going to have the bonus talk by Elaine, who is here. Can you hear us, Elaine? Yes, I'm sharing screen. Okay, Elaine. So the first okay, yes. Yeah. Thank you all so much uh, for being so accommodating. Uh, I'm going to give the bonus talk on non-interactive anonymous router. This is joint work with my student, Ke Wu. Uh, so anonymous routing is a classical problem. It has been studied for decades, right? So we have N senders and N receivers in this picture. Every sender wants to talk to a distinct receiver. So there are some routing permutation, pi, among them. Uh, and we want to uh, let the users communicate without leaking the routing permutation, nor uh, the contents of the messages. Many solutions have been proposed for this problem. For instance, you may have heard of MixNet, uh, Dining Cryptographer's Net, Tor, and many other systems. And, and uh, if you think about it, all of these solutions have something in common. Uh, they rely on decentralized trust and they rely on interactive protocols. In other words, typically there are multiple routers and we need, need to assume a threshold of them are honest in order to get the anonymity. Okay, so when I was working with my systems collaborators, uh, they kept asking me, can we do this you know, on a single untrusted router, not interactively? I was really intrigued by this question, so I started giving it a more serious thought. Uh, let's first look at a very silly solution to get a sense of the problem. Suppose every sender and its receiver, they share a secret key. And now every sender sends its uh, plain text uh, encrypted under the secret key shared with its own receiver. And the router simply forwards all n ciphertexts to all n receivers, and each receiver can de decrypt exactly one of them. And this solution works, except that it's expensive because the communication blow up is linear in the number of users. And so what we want to know is whether we can achieve the same without this uh, linear communication blow up. And you know, it would be nice if we can um, have communication blow up that's poly kappa, where kappa is the security parameter and independent of n. So th this is what we call succinct communication. And I claim if you have VBB obfuscation, and there's a solution which works like this. So let's say everyone encrypts their message under some public key PK. And there's an obfuscated program that has the decryption key. It would decrypt all the incoming ciphertexts. It would apply the permutation and then it would um, encrypt each outgoing ciphertext under the corresponding receiver's public key. Okay, uh, so here the obfuscation is hiding not just the decryption key, but also the routing permutation itself. Um, so this works, except that you know VBB obfuscation is impossible. Um, so here's our result. And you, you may think this is something that would require program obfuscation, but we show that somewhat surprisingly, we can get it just from standard bilinear group assumptions. Uh, and uh, our scheme has a cute name. It's called non-interactive anonymous router or near uh, for short. Um, so in our scheme, there's a one-time trusted setup. Uh, and afterwards, the senders and receivers can communicate for unbounded number of rounds. Uh, the communication blow up, as I promised, is only poly kappa. Uh, and uh, also importantly, we achieve security not, against, not just against the untrusted router, but also even when some of the players are corrupt and colluding with the router, you know, some of the senders and receivers can be corrupt and colluding with the router. And in this case, we still guarantee security among the honest senders and receivers. And um, so I, I won't have time to go into the technical details, but at the core of our construction is a new function private multi-client functional encryption scheme for the selection operation. Um, uh, so essentially this is related to a prior line of work on multi-client in the product encryption, 
but all these, because like selection is actually just a special case of in the product, but it turns out all of the prior works, um, multi-client in the product encryption, they are not function hiding. So therefore they are not a, a, a fit for our purpose. So the main core technical challenge we have to resolve is how to get function hiding. And, uh, and I just want to end with a cool application. We can use this to implement a non-interactive anonymous shuffler, right? So imagine we want to have a COVID daily check and but we want to uh, protect the user's uh, anonymity, uh, but nonetheless, we want to kind of uh, track each individual user over time to see like, for instance, uh, how, how well they're feeling over time. And in this case, uh, you can imagine there's a server that's acting as both the router and all the receivers. And, and all the uh, senders would encrypt their daily reports and the router can only decrypt it um, when it becomes shuffled. So like, in other words, if you want to decrypt the plain text, uh, you are forced to shuffle them and the permutation is unknown. Okay. Um, so in our paper, we have some additional results which I didn't have time to talk about. Like for instance, we, we define um, Besides the basic security, which suffices for most practical applications, we also consider a paranoid notion of security. And we show that the paranoid notion can be realized with indistinguishability, indistinguishability obfuscation. So there we do need obfuscation, but for the basic notion of security, we only need bilinear groups. We also consider a fault tolerant version of near. Uh, and then in the paper, we have uh, formal definitions and proofs that it turns out like even for how to formally define security is like somewhat subtle and non-trivial. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Elaine. Uh, I think we have a question. And let, let me look at, is it in the chat? Uh, yeah. Uh, is it assumed that the set of the senders and receivers are fixed and or they can churn later? And th this is a fixed set, set of senders and receivers, but in the fault tolerant version, we allow some senders to drop off line and still we are able to uh, perform the decryption if some, some of them drop off line. But, but the set of senders and receivers, they are fixed during the a priori setup. And once the setup is done, the senders and receivers can perform multiple rounds of communication. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, are there any more questions? Uh, if not, then let's thank Elaine again. And uh, this concludes this session. We will resume at four with the tampering, non-malleability, and false uh, session. Thank you.